Today's presentation is the sixth and final in our critical manufacturing webinar series and it is on welding. I'm Courtney Young, an attorney in Medmark's risk management department. On behalf of Medmark, PRI, and today's presenters, Gabe Kustra, Rashawn Lane, and Brent Esch, thank you for joining us. Gabe Kustra is a staff engineer at the Performance Research Institute with 10 years of experience in the medical device industry. His career specialty is in laser and resistance welding and has worked in active implantables, orthopedics, sterile disposables, and diagnostic imaging. He has held positions in product development, manufacturing, and supplier quality, and has experience as a manual welder and machinist. Rashawn Lane is a senior supplier quality engineer for Depew Synthes Joint Reconstruction. He has over six years of experience in the medical device industry and has worked in clinical diagnostics, endoscopy, patient temperature management, and orthopedics, and has held positions in product development, production, and quality. Brent Esch is the supplier quality lead engineer with GE Healthcare. He has 10 years of welding experience in mining and medical device industries and is a current member of the MediCred Welding Subcommittee. He works with developing suppliers and welding and inspection activities and has experience working in welding NPI, manufacturing, engineering, and supplier quality. With that, I am pleased to turn things over to Gabe, who will begin today's presentation. Hey, so today we'd like to talk a little bit about uh, welding as a critical manufacturing process and how it relates to patient safety. With that being said, during today's discussion, we'll introduce the most common welding processes used in medical devices, determining when welds are critical through risk assessments, examples of actual weld failures that did pose a risk to patient safety, things that are required in order to stay compliant to a welding process, potential product failure scenarios, the top nonconformances in process audits, finding a root cause for weld issues and effective corrective actions to permanently solve them. So when you think of welding, you may picture somebody working in a shipyard or on a construction site using a, a stick welder and striking an arc, but welding actually has many forms. Most of the welding processes used on medical devices are ones that can be scaled down for use on smaller parts and also that can weld a wide variety of materials. Some of the most common welding processes used in medical devices are laser welding, which uses a beam of intense focused light, resistance welding, which uses electrical resistance at the interface of two mating parts, electron beam, which uses a high energy beam of electrons, and gas tungsten arc welding, which is also known as TIG welding, which uses electrical current and a tungsten electrode to produce an arc. As you can probably see from the explanations of these different welding processes, they're much different from each other in terms of how the energy is used to create a weld and the process variables which need to be controlled to produce consistent results. The medical device industry includes such a wide range of products and the applications for welds serve many purposes. Uh, welds, welded assemblies come in all sizes, so there's, uh, there's quite a range of uh, applications. Uh, Rashawn, can you talk a little bit about the different types of welding that are used in the parts uh, for the industry that, parts of the industry that you've worked in? one over the other. So uh, for uh, GTAL or TIG, um, it's usually a little more portable, um, a little uh, smaller startup cost. Um, so it's pretty easy to get into. You know, you could have one of those in your garage. Um, of course, there are a lot more um, regulated when they're, you know, within the medical device industry, but usually a little lower startup um, then when you get into like laser and electron beam, uh, those are a little better, a little more automated. Um, they're less energy. So, you know, if you wanted a part that you're not gonna have to do a whole lot of work to, you know, those are kind of the ones you would lean towards uh, with the E-beam being a little more complex because it's usually done in a vacuum. Uh, but they're all very efficient and effective. It just depends on you know, really your materials and the applications. Okay, so um, another thing the, um, in the medical device industry is the, the wide range of materials that are used. Like other industries, 
we do a lot with common materials such as steel, stainless steel, aluminum, and titanium. But we're also, we also use precious metals like gold, platinum, palladium, more exotic or rare metals like tantalum, niobium, and molybdenum, and specialty alloys like cobalt chrome, nitinol, MP35N, which have properties that are conducive to certain medical device applications. Welds are used for more than just uh, structural applications. They're also used for hermetic seals and for electrical connections. The size applications range from tiny implantable devices to large room-sized diagnostic machines. Sometimes the welds on components have a critical function which has an effect on patient safety, and sometimes they don't. Um, since welded components have different applications, some welded components are critical for patient safety while others are not. Um, Rashawn, I know a lot of, you use a lot of different materials in the uh, orthopedics industry. Can you tell us a little bit about the materials that are used? Yeah, um, for orthopedics, I would say most often they're your, the common materials you see there, the steels and uh, stainless steels, um, especially just thinking about uh, the applications. You know, a lot of these instruments are used, you know, they're, it's almost advanced carpentry, right? So you're beating on these instruments and, you know, they're seeing torsions and, you know, they're being twisted around. So um, I see a, a lot more of uh, really the steels. Okay. In order to determine um, which which parts are most critical, uh, that can be done by establishing the level of risk to the patient's safety if the part were to fail. If the part utilizes a welding process in order to manufacture it, the components, materials, and manufacturing processes should be controlled when making that high-risk part. The OEM will decide which level of risk is associated with each part. Some parts don't pose a risk uh, at all if they fail. And in some cases, the lower level process, the lower level risk parts may not need to have the same level of control. So, Rashawn, can you give us some information on how uh, risk assessments are done? Sure. Yes. So, um, risk assessments, you know, really critical. And you know, as as the parts become more risky, you usually have a higher level of, you know, understanding of how that that part functions. So, you're looking at, you know, the metallurgy and the you know the mechanical properties of that weld. Um, you want to do more testing uh, as it becomes more risky. So some of the considerations usually in designing a weld, you would look at, you know, what kind of, what's the function of that device? So what kind of stress is it going to see? Um, you know, is it something that's beat on, you know, over and over again? Is it something that, you know, may share the load that's going to be applied to it? So maybe it's threaded in or, you know, pressed in and then you weld it, you know, that's not going to be as risky as if the weld is going to bear all of your, uh, the load that it will see. Um, you want to look at, um, you know, where is the instrument or device going to be used? So is it going to be within the wound site or is it going to be outside of the wound site? Um, if it fails, you know, could there be fragmentation uh, that could affect the the patient. Uh, you want to look at the user. So if it if the instrument or device were to fail, um, could the nurse or the surgeon you know be harmed by it? Um, and then also just um, one thing we see is uh, surgical delay. So um, even you know if if the device comes in a kit and it's a you know there's a duplicate in there, it may not be as risky as opposed to if the instrument fails and, you know, there's nothing else the surgeon can use. So uh, a lot of considerations, and those are all, you know, kind of considered up front during the design, and those um, those risks will lead you to, you know, the level of controls and scrutiny you want to place on that weld. 
Okay, so here are some examples of recalls that are documented by the FDA for products that pose a risk to the patient's safety because of faulty welds. A linear accelerator used for radiation therapy had a defective weld seam, which could fail, and the overhead suspension could fall, leading to the patient being injured. Uh, there was also a recall for endoscopic shaver blades because an insufficient weld between the shaft tube and the tip could result in the tip separating from the shaft uh, during use. So compliance to a welding process means there's control over the receiving of welding consumables and materials to ensure that they meet specifications and they have been properly identified that preparation of parts to be welded are processed according to the instructions for steps such as cleaning and storage, that the process is repeatable by having control over the welding fixtures, the work instructions, and the welding parameters to ensure nothing has changed, and make sure that the inspection is done in accordance with requirements, that the test data is available and recorded, and that there's traceability between the parts and their inspection results. So, Brent, I know that you have some experience with doing supplier audits. Can you provide some comments on what you've seen in the supplier uh, at the supplier facilities? Sure. <clears throat> so, when we talk about compliance to the process as critical, um, obviously we're, we're keeping um, patient safety in mind, but uh, one thing to consider is that compliance in some cases is a legal requirement. Um, for example, um, selling products into Europe some products require a CE marking in this in directly related to welding, um, welding of uh, pressure vessels. So suppliers are required um, to be audited by a third party, um, can be TUV, SGS, um, that is certifying these suppliers to um, the PED requirements for pressure equipment directive. Uh, and failure to follow compliance in, uh, of the process can lead to the loss of a CE mark, which would essentially um, result in the loss of the, the European market for medical devices. Okay, so uh, staying compliant to the established welding process keeps product quality consistent. It's not always obvious when weld issues are present, and sometimes a small change in the amount of energy used to create welds can introduce more heat into the part and actually damage sensitive components that are nearby. Uh, solutions to keep the welding process as consistent as possible are repeatable machine setups, compliance to the established settings, in-process testing, and the preventive, preventive maintenance of the welding equipment. So here's an example of how a product could fail in the event that a welding process is not well controlled. The manufacturing of active implantable medical devices such as pacemakers, ICDs, and neurostimulators is highly dependent on the welding process. A small circuit board, a battery, and other electronic components are sealed inside of a titanium enclosure which gets laser welded shut. An ideal weld schedule is established through a series of experiments that ensures the desired weld properties will be met and also the sensitive contents inside are not adversely affected. Deviation from the welding parameters could increase the heat input during the welding process and damage or compromise internal components and connections. Patient safety is at risk when heat sensitive parts are compromised due to, weld, due to the welding if it's not adequately controlled. So this is an example where the weld may not actually be bad, but the product becomes bad uh, due to, a, problem, due to a, a lack of control in the welding process. So another example is uh, where a weld can be compromised, but it's not always an obvious failure. Uh, surgical instruments are frequently manufactured as welded assemblies. They can be held to high dimensional tolerances when they're completed. Um, welding processes must be developed to produce welds that meet the strength requirements, the finish requirements, and retain dimensional requirements. If there's any variation in the welding process or setup, 
the weld can be insufficient, and the only way to detect it is through testing, which may or may not be feasible for production. So if you're making a lot of these parts and the testing is time consuming, uh, there's there's a chance that um, since since the testing takes a long period of time, that the supplier may be uh, welding these parts and relying on a validation to determine if the process is sufficient. And uh, but if in the event that there is a failure, uh, the part can actually look like it's good, but uh, it can have a weld that's compromised. So tools with insufficient welds can make it out in the field and fail in service where it's a risk to the safety of the patient. So controls must be in place to ensure all the requirements are met. After reviewing, after reviewing uh, the results of audits we conduct here at PRI, there are some nonconformances that are more common than others. Among the most common nonconformances are compliance to the weld schedule, failure to follow procedure, tools and fixtures not being identified in the work instructions, equipment and instruments not being calibrated in the range of use, undocumented steps that uh, may be taking place out on the on the manufacturing floor, um, inadequate or complete absence of procedures. Uh, Brent, with your experience in auditing, can you provide some comments on what you've seen? Yeah. Um, so again, talking about the the top nonconformances here, you, you know, the compliance to weld schedule, failure to follow procedure. You know, sometimes suppliers and uh, you know welding companies will change a process because they can do it more efficiently. Um, you know, either through faster production or even cost savings. But sometimes they don't realize it has an unintended consequence um, with either the design. Um, you know, sometimes suppliers think as long as the part is delivered in the condition in which a print states, that it may not ma matter how it's manufactured. And, and it really does have, you know, the weld schedules, procedures play a large uh, role in the functionality of, of parts. Um, you know, sometimes. Uh, equipment um, being uncalibrated I, again it may not seem like a, a very big deal but you know if, if you're running out of range um, out of your parameters and the equipment is not capable of telling you that you are again you may have um, issues with the, the functionality of the part that the supplier may not be aware of um, so these are all you know when I've done auditing um, they're, they're very common findings um, with, with companies as far as control of procedure schedules, um, work instructions, they're, they're all very common findings. So where nonconformances exist, not only does the issue need corrected, but the root cause of that issue also needs to be corrected. It's important to take the root cause as far as possible. A root cause shouldn't identify employees or the training as the culprit, it should identify the flaw within the company's quality system. It's tempting to uh, blame human error or training issues for the cause of any findings. However, those root causes uh, can't be addressed permanently. We know that human errors can occur regardless of experience, and although employees can always receive better training, Training only temporarily reinforces a person's knowledge and loses its effectiveness when new employees take over the position. The best root cause tells us why the company's quality system or operating procedures allowed the mistake to happen. It's not the employee who suffers from nonconformances or quality issues, it's the company. When working with a, an accreditation organization, a registrar, or a regulating agency, the company is held responsible for product escapes regardless of the actions of the employees. So when a root cause investigation exposes the flaw in the company's quality system, a permanent corrective action can be implemented in order to ensure that the solution stays with the company. In order to address the root cause, a corrective action should be implemented. Uh, corrective actions should be systematic changes within the company's procedures or their quality system. They must ensure whatever went wrong can't go wrong again. So 
Examples of strong corrective actions include error-proofing the tooling, locked weld schedules or, or weld settings whenever it's possible with that particular equipment, shop routers that require documented confirmation that something has been completed, um, documented preventive maintenance schedules, proceduralized internal audits or walkthroughs, and an improved change control process. So that uh, whenever these things that do get changed, uh, that, you know, maybe like Brent was talking about where uh, something has found, the, something was discovered to be more efficient out on the manufacturing floor uh, and the supplier or manufacturer wants to implement that change, but they don't uh, include it on their, their work instructions, uh, having a change control system that ensures that uh, all of the document documentation, shop floor documentation is being properly updated is, is a big help. So what is the medical device industry doing to improve the quality of welded products and supply chain oversight? The industry is now coming together by participating in programs like Metacred, which is a supply chain accreditation program where medical device OEMs collaborate to form an industry-managed program that provides accreditation to suppliers for critical manufacturing processes such as welding. Each process that's accredited by Metacred is managed by a task group. The welding task group is currently made up of representatives from Stryker, Depew, which is the division of Johnson & Johnson, and GE Healthcare. Uh, the task group is always open to uh, subject matter experts from OEMs, suppliers, anyone really uh, involved in the industry that makes designs or makes uh, medical device products. Um, together, the task group develops audit criteria, approves the welding auditors that go out and actually do the auditing, and grants the supplier their accreditation. So. MetaCredit accreditation is used by OEMs as a criteria to award new business and oversee their critical process supply chain quality. Suppliers use MetaCred accreditation to ensure final product quality and improve manufacturing operations. Now is the time for questions. Uh, my information is uh, on this slide if you'd like to contact me uh, about MetaCred or uh, our our uh, MetaCred manager, Justin McCabe, his information is on the slide as well. Great. We'll turn to Q&A then. Um, we've had a couple come in while you guys have been talking. Um, so I'll open this up to anyone, but can two different types of metals be welded together? Okay. So the answer to that question is sometimes. Um, welding processes that utilize fusion, like gas tungsten arc welding or laser, uh, are less likely to produce the results, good results, because of the act of fusion requires both metals to alloy together. Although the two metals will physically fuse together, they may or they may not form a strong ductile weld, depending on their alloying compatibility with each other. If the metals aren't compatible, they'll likely just form a weld that's brittle and would be unacceptable in most applications. Uh, in resistance welding, dissimilar metal welds are more likely to produce good results because the joint doesn't necessarily require fusion. The two metals can be heated to the point where they don't melt, but they become soft enough to forge together. Depending on the requirements of the product, a dissimilar joint can be used if the results are shown to meet the needs of the application. Okay. Just a note for those of you that might want to ask a question. Please feel free to submit it using the Q&A panel at the bottom right of the screen. After typing your question, hit the Send button. Please be sure to address your questions to all panelists in the Ask menu. Your questions will not be seen by other audience members. We've got another one here. Um, what is the difference between welding and brazing, and is brazing used in the medical device industry? Okay, so the main difference between welding and brazing is that there's no fusion in brazing and brazing relies on a filler material between the two pieces that are being joined together. So the, the parent materials don't melt, but the braze filler material does. The braze material creates a bond on the interior surfaces of the joint, and the braze 
brazing requires the joint to have a, a small clearance with enough gap that capillary action can take place and draw the braze into the joint. Um, just like welding, there's different ways to braze. Uh, it's commonly done with a, a furnace. It's also done using an induction coil to heat the part. Uh, and it's also done the old-fashioned way by, um, by hand with a torch. Uh, brazing is used in the medical device industry because it's a good solution for dissimilar metal joints, uh, being that it doesn't require fusion to dissimilar metals that would otherwise be incompatible could be brazed together. Uh, it also can be used to braze to join metals to ceramics. And in some cases, the shape of a part um, may not allow access for welding, or the joint configuration may have much more internal surface area than the area on the outside, which would be the weld seam. So in both of these cases, a braze joint might be preferred. Brazings used to make um, feed-throughs for active implantable devices. And it's also used uh, on some surgical instruments. So it, it is used in the industry. OK, thanks so much. Um, got another one here. Uh, which welding processes are the MediCred program focusing on right now? And what about plans for the future? So MediCred right now focuses on fusion welding, which covers uh, gas tungsten arc welding and gas metal arc welding, which is commonly known as MIG welding. Uh, we also cover laser welding, electron beam, and we cover, we're soon going to be covering uh, resistance welding and brazing. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions we've got, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you so much for a really informative webinar. This is the last and final webinar in our manufacturing series, but you can see the whole series on our YouTube playlist dedicated to our PRI collaboration, and that's found on Medmark's YouTube channel or on the Medmark website. Thank you very much for joining us. This concludes today's webinar.